<laughs> so yeah, it was because uh, Witchboard had not come out yet. Witchboard actually came out while we were shooting. Night of the Demon. So we did not know yet that we had a hit on our hands with Witchboard. I probably could have got more, but no. <laughs> <laughs> and Linnea from our panel last night, you had a little bit of hesitation when you first read the script as well. Or was it even before you read the script? Well, it wasn't before. But I was scared to go in because I thought they would reject me because I was like 25 at the time and all the kids were supposed to be teenagers and so I kept saying to my manager I wasn't going to go in because I didn't want them to say oh you're too old for it and so I just kept saying no I'm not going to go in it's oh you really want to see you oh no I'm not going to go in so it was just the luck that I got to work with having Tenny actually needs a watch <laughs> if anybody has a watch if anyone wants to get the, be able to claim that they're my number one fan <laughs> just throwing it out there. Just, just a suggestion. <laughs> so you read it back when it was called Halloween Party. Yes. Was there a huge amount of change from the original script into what was shot? Well, we totally lost the scene with the aircraft carrier and not <laughs> <laughs> no, but otherwise it's pretty close to the original script. <laughs> <laughs> we had some crane shots in it, though. Yeah, we did. Actually, uh, there was a. a this, the script I read. Now, if you if you read interviews with Joe Augustine, his original draft was drastically different, but they went through a lot of changes before I came on board. Uh, the biggest changes, the ones that I affected, were there was an opening where a priest spoke directly to the audience and blessed them all so they wouldn't get possessed while watching the movie. <laughs> and I told Joe, I said, that might be a little too corny <laughs> to start our film so we just said screw it and, didn't, and we cut that. And then the only other things for me were in passing when we were talking about the script, he said something about the house being possessed instead of haunted. But there wasn't really addressed in the script. And I said, well, that's great. That's actually the hook right there. That's what, we're, that's what makes this special is it's not ghosts, it's demons. And so I had him, I said, write about that. So then that's when he gave uh, Angela her, her whole... Uh, Spiel. Uh, this is a house that's been possessed and not haunted and yada yada yada. Because I thought that would be an interesting hook for the audience. And then the only other thing was uh, Judy, the heroine, was originally dressed like Little Red Riding Hood. And I thought, uh, if we're doing a film about demons, you really don't want her running around in a big red cloak and cape. I said, and two, there were a, uh, logic problems with the script in that, you know, the door can lock itself, and then it can't unlock itself, but it can make its cotter pins fall out so that it'll fall off. So I thought, if we address each of these logically, we kill the momentum. And so many of these sequences were great sequences, but you just had to not worry, get bogged down in the fact that they didn't make sense. So I thought, well, let's dress her like Alice in Wonderland, that gets her out of red, which has demonic connotations. And then subconsciously we're saying, Hey, the house is Wonderland and it's just fucking with her. <laughs> and, and, and once I told that to the crew, they actually took the point that the art department in the scene where they're in the embalming room uh, and all the bottles are there, you can't see it on film, but one of them, they had a little bottle there that said, drink me. <laughs> so I didn't see that. I think Amelia just showed up. Uh, so let's get a warm round of applause. This might go with Clicks them three times, she'll be back in Hell House. <laughs> now, um, as, uh, as far as, like, I I know that you were a little, oh, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to do this, I'm a little too old for it. Did any of you know each other before this or had seen each other's work? No. No, actually, I was not a horror fan at this time, so... Joe knew, Joe, who, was. Joe knew who <laughs> Linnea was. Kevin, you're not supposed I to know, I know, I know. He knew who, and, and the casting director knew who Linnea was. She might have even worked with him, Tedra Gabriel. Yes, I, I think she cashed that. you yes, in one did. of the prison films or something. I think Savage Streets or something. Okay, so something she like knew that. you, and, um, and I just, she came in red and I liked her, but I didn't know who she was. But the funny thing was I knew somebody had worked with her, and he had told me a story about her, but could not... I didn't know who she was when he told me the story, so it wasn't until after we were there. So, oh, this is the gal that he was talking about. It was a good story. Oh, my God. Like, what story? It was like, oh, my God, now I've got this bitch, and I can't do anything with it. No, <laughs> so, it was a good story, but it was funny that I made the connection about halfway through the film. Oh, my God, this is the gal he was talking about. 
And Joe was also like a big uh, um, MTV fan, so he knew who Amelia was from uh, the video she did for the Stray Cats, Sexy and Seventeen. So I didn't know who either of them were, but they came in red. They did a really nice job, and uh, so we cast them. Don't oh, worry, we didn't know who he was. Either. That's right. I, That's yeah, which right. one did not come out yet, so I was still an unknown <laughs> commodity as well. That's right. That's right. Now, Amelia, did, were you a horror fan before you came into Night of the Demons? You know, this is a question that cannot be answered in this room. <laughs> it's okay. I, just did. I know. I know he just did. I um. I wanted to work with Steve Johnson, who That's had right. just won an Oscar for Ghostbusters. I thought the special effects were going to be incredibly fun. Little did you know. Yes. <laughs> no, they're not. 27 hours as a snake is not fun. <laughs> Glued to a teeter-totter, strapped in a trench. No, it wasn't fun. It fun wasn't for us who were just watching. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, no, so... I, I was a fan of special effects because I, w I was fascinated by it. I think it's a very interesting art form. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, all of you together, how was, how was pre-production? Was it a long pre-production? Was it very short? Was there pre-production? Yeah, there was pre-production. <laughs> Actually, by pure luck, we found the house early. And because of that, whenever there was not something going on in the office where we were casting or I was dealing with script notes, I would hop in my car and I would drive over to the house and I would walk through it with a, a viewfinder that tells you, you know, you can actually adjust it like a lens, like a zoom lens. So of all the films I've ever shot, that was probably the one I was best prepared for. And I think it shows, I mean, because, you, you know, every, so I knew not only how I was going to want to shoot the film, but I knew what lenses I was going to want to use for each shot. So when we got there, I could just say, you know, throw on an 80, throw on a 200, whatever. Um, and one of the decisions I made early was to, in order for the environment of the house to be drastically different from everything else that was shot in the film, um, I used all long lenses when they were not in the house, like at Judy's house or out on the road, uh, because that flattens the background. And then in the house, I didn't shoot with anything less. It, the 25 was the longest lens I used. I think I used a 35 for a couple of shots I had to use, but 35, 25, or a 9 8 so that even in a room, like from, if you were three feet from that wall, it would still look like you were in a hallway, because the wall would be so far behind you. And that was just so that the house would be creepier. And everybody thinks it's easy being a director. <laughs> <laughs> now, as actors, did you have an opportunity to, to rehearse a lot together, or was that not really a part of, of the pre-production for you? Not a lot of rehearsal. I, think I don't we did remember. A week. I can't remember. We may have done a week, about but honestly, uh, about half of my answer is coming out of my ass. Because <laughs> it's 25 it's, years it's ago. It's been a few yes. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't remember. I don't remember a lot. And I, I certainly will say for the pre-production and rehearsal, mm -hmm. I've never been on a panel with these two people. <laughs> this is a little bit, we're making history here. So I get to talk about them, and you can hear stories that you have never heard before. That's right. But there were things that Except Kevin... Except the restraining order. Yeah, Kevin <laughs> Kevin um, improvised at the last minute some shots that became history. I mean, really movie-making history. Some of those things were not pre-planned. I mean, the, the shot with the broken mirror and all of us looking into it. That was uh, oh, Putting that was me on great. roller skates to make me float down the hallway. None of these things were thought through in advance. I mean, there was one scene where Steve Johnson is smoking cigarettes, blowing them up my skirt, so that the smoke is coming out in little tubes out of my fingers. And while I have you here, because I recently, we got to see the Blu-ray screening in Hollywood, which sold out Aww. immediately. Oh, yeah, you you weren't there. That was so much fun. But what we had in the script was, and now she's possessed. <laughs> <laughs> and you look at it and you go, okay, what does that mean? You know, as an actor, what does that mean? And Linnea, you were so good. She kind of set the bar for the other actors to follow. That's how we'll be when we're possessed. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. You were so good. I mean, you're such. It's such. But I gave them excellent direction, like don't fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> Be possessed and don't fuck it up. Yeah. Exactly.
And now you dance. <laughs> and your dance was and amazing. I, I was oh, out. You. you know, that's true. She choreographed her own dance, and she also improvised a lot while she was dancing. And I knew she was going to do this, and I knew I wanted to get some great shots of it. So Dave Lewis and I, the DP, uh, we actually got a, a remote camera that's usually only used for rock videos at that time that was on a dolly and then a jib arm that we controlled from the other room so we didn't have to be in the room and the camera could just follow her. So when she's laying on the floor popping up, we just basically let her do what she was doing and we ended up getting great shots because she would fall down on the floor and then we would drop down with her. And we, I think we did like, you did it twice. We did two takes and then, I just, and then I just cut the one pieces from each shot that I liked the best together to... Uh, do the dance and uh, it and worked out amazing. Yeah, and there's no CGI in there. It's like yeah. the strobe lights were going. There was no such thing as CGI. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, 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 it was. Yeah. We didn't know what it was in Demons 2. I barely knew what film was. Oh, ah, yeah. yeah but they said, now you're going to throw a fireball. And I was like, okay, well, who's going to set my hand on fire? And they said, no, no, it's CGI. I said, what's that? Actually, was it CGI or just optical? What's I think it's optical. That? Optical. I don't think CGI I, even yeah. exists there. I didn't even know what yeah. they were talking about. Like, optical was they'd draw have to do the it. Fireball. They would have to like get a pen light and it would have to be done like animation. You would have to. Well, that's only because you trained. didn't direct it. You would have just set me on fire. Yeah, I would have set you on fire. <laughs> I, said, I would give you a tumbleweed, lit it on fire, say, throw the fucker. <laughs> and throw this. <laughs> don't Wait hit me. Wait for me, yeah. <laughs> Miss Wait. me and the camera. Anything else? Fair game. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> I was just going to comment, it's very funny that we have two ladies who have had two very iconic dances in horror between Amelia oh, and Amelia. Yeah, it's probably that, that way. Yeah. 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 Yes, I danced on a tombstone, you danced in a haunted house. A possessed house. And I danced on my ex girlfriend's grave, so. Where's my drummer? Where's my drummer? <laughs> If I remember correctly, you had a cameo in this film, so technically all of you acted in this film. That's right, yes. I'm, 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 I have the riveting role of guy shopping for milk in the back of the store. <laughs> that Obviously like you all remember that. Yes, I remember it. No, he was acting because if it was real life, he would have been shopping for beer. Yeah, that's what he would have and, and I think Joe Augustin, the writer-producer, was off to the left checking out the chips. <laughs> oh, oh my God. God. That's so funny. <laughs> now, was that, that was something that was shot in an actual convenience store in L.A.? Yes. Were there any, you know, there were any, uh, you know, just regular, I almost said human extras, any just regular civilian extras that were a little taken aback by what was going on? No, no. You, you, when you, you rent the store, even though it's a real store, you rent it and then you control it. So everyone, all the extras in the store are actually crew people. Just anyone who wasn't actually working while we were doing that shot got pulled in to be, in the, to be an extra in the, the scene. Well, we had a lot of security because we were not shooting in a great place. No, we were shooting in lots. Yeah. <laughs> the house is at the corner, or was at the corner the of Adams really and Vermont. house really looked like that. Yeah, it was at the corner of Adams and Vermont, which is, you know, not a great area. <laughs> so we had very heavy security, and we're shooting at night. And, you know, and of course we had to retake a lot of the dialogue scenes because of machine gun fire. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people want to have that house. Like when I talk to people, yeah. they're like, I'd love to have that house as my house to live in. No, it was tragic that it got, yeah. it got torn down. Those were really gorgeous yeah. Hollywood historic oh, homes. Yeah. And it was huge. It was actually two buildings with a porch that joined them. So it was like a gigantic, it took up like a whole corner lot, so it was huge. And back in the day of old Hollywood, that was a nice part of town. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, well that's you know, what happens where, where Charlie Chaplin and the old movie stars <coughs> lived, and the, it was a beautiful home. Mm. If we could start with Amelia, out of curiosity, mm -hmm. is there one part of this film that was just the absolute hardest for you to film, and you just felt like, I just don't want to do that? Uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. On the spot now, baby. Uh -oh. Don't worry, it's coming to you too, Kevin. And we'll it again. <laughs> Will taking the prosthetics off took an hour and a half. Oh, Getting them on took five or six hours. And uh, it only took a few nights of that before I was really not having fun. I was uh, really not fun. And at one point, I remember the makeup people saying, We have to send her home because she has. 
bleeding wounds in her face. Oh. Oh. We can't make up over bleeding, gaping wounds. Oscar winner, my ass. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. No, but they, the, the, the stuff coming off is so glued on. Oh, it's it's so just, awful. You know, I mean, it's tough on the guys, but. The women who have these, you know, beautiful alabaster uh, faces. Oh, oh well, it was you know, brutal. The one night, I think Hal was in tears, yeah. saying, "Can I sleep in it?" Yeah, <laughs> can I, I sleep just want to sleep in it. Don't take it off all. and put it back on the yeah. next day. Oh, man, that's bad. Um, <laughs> so, did I dread any scenes in Demons One? Anything that said demon. No, no, I have to say no. And number two, I got to shag Darren to death, which was a good time. But I got paid to do that. Oh my god. I'm in the wrong end of the business. And demons to the snake makeup was hard. It was hard and it was intense. If you haven't seen Demons 2 yet, they they turned me into Kermit the Frog. And I, I'm, I'm a 30-foot snake. And all practical. All pra no CGI, all yeah. practical. And in retrospect, I can say that if I hadn't been a professional dancer, I couldn't have done that. When I was growing up, we take off our point shoes and pour the blood out and put them back on and finish the, the Nutcracker rehearsal. That's what it meant to be a ballerina. That's what it still means to be a ballerina. And you couldn't throw up your hands and say, ouch, my face hurts and my fangs are bleeding. Will you take the shit off my face? <laughs> you just soldier through it. And um, also, Vinaya, because you also got to dance in a film, this was at a time I hit Hollywood right after Flashdance. So Maureen Jahan was the, uh, the person who got to do the dancing in Flashdance. And one of my partners, Peter Tram, was the one who did um, the dancing in Footloose. And then they had another double to do the gymnastics. So it was a world where you were an actor or a dancer. You couldn't really be both. And we both got to be yeah. both in movies and not get doubled. And I got to choreograph our own dances, and that was pretty darn fabulous. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And I got, to be, I got to be a director and a sex symbol. <laughs> <laughs> to this day. To this day. And remains forever. And humble. <laughs> Kevin, for you, same same question. I mean, is there any time that you were like, screw it, I'm done. I'm done with this. Or did you have a good time all the way? No, actually, I had a pretty good time. I had just done Witchboard, which was a much more serious horror film. And, and when you're doing the scenes where the characters have to cry and have all these emotional moments, the crew has to be quiet and you have to give them, the actors, time to get to a dark place using whatever techniques they use to get there. And then you have to shoot the scene and... And whether it's going well or badly, you can't say, that was great, now let's go for another, or, oh, that sucked. You have to be very respectful of their process. And in Night of the Demons, since it was really just a campy, let's have fun movie, we never had to, even when we were shooting stuff like, even like things like eyes getting blown out and all, it was like, we're having fun, let's fuck those suckers, you know? So it was always fun. The only time... I mean, you always, you're always, when you've got a small budget and an ambitious script, you're always fighting with time. Time is your enemy. And there were times when we were like down to the wire and I wanted to do a fancy shot and the producers were just like, we need to get this shot before the sun rises. Um, usually you're, you're fighting sunset, we were always fighting sunrise. But um, the shot with the mirrors, because I had plotted it out in my head how I wanted to do it. I had the art department build a false floor that we put at a 45 degree angle. I explained to the cameraman how we, I wanted to do it, um, but didn't know if it was going to work. And so we're shooting. And, no, and when I kept telling everyone what I went, no one seemed to quite, I couldn't explain yeah. it clearly to everybody. They like, oh, uh, what? And I finally just said, put the floor up. You stand there. And then half the cast on Apple boxes, half, uh, a third on Apple boxes, third just standing on the floor, another third like kneeling so that they would be at different levels. And what we had to do is wrap the camera completely in duvetine, which is like a black felt that absorbs light so that you wouldn't see the camera in any of the mirrors. And then we had to place the, all the actors around, and we had to place the mirror. And the cameraman would sit there and go, okay, move that piece of glass. Okay, now I have 
I have uh, Linnea in that neat piece of glass, and they say, okay, okay, now I have Amelia in that, and we did that with everyone, and then they all had to duck. And, so, and, take, and then I just, you know, okay, you stand up first, you, you, you. So it all looks like you're walking up to the mirrors, but you're all just standing up. And so we're about halfway through it. Everyone started to realize what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And Kathy Podwell said, oh, this is a great shot. Have you done this before? <laughs> I said, if I had done this before, I wouldn't be sitting here shitting myself. <laughs> because if when we're done, it doesn't work, I've just wasted my whole shooting day to get this oh, one shot. And I won't have time to shoot this scene standard. So we either get it in the mirror or we are, you know, big time screwed. So luckily it came out exactly as I had envisioned it. Uh, and they don't take the time now to really get shots like that in, mm. in the so-called movies. Yeah. And that was his choreography. That was his moment of choreographing <laughs> yeah. something really amazing. Do you all know what we're talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I remember him saying, maybe you got to move an eighth of an inch more to the left because we can see somebody else's head behind you. Trying to get each one of us in each little piece of glass. And it's true. It was like, you, you talk about an actor having to say their lines, find their light, hit their mark, which you can always tell when you're working with someone who hasn't done movies yet and someone who has because they know how to do it. But even if you knew how to do all that, this was new because this was like, find your light, Hit your mark, know your line, and while you're at it, do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. This is great. This is dog shit. Perfect. Yeah. You're fucking me. Yeah. You're Oscar worthy. You're ruining my movie. So, and, they, and, and we had ten of them. So it's like everyone, nine of you did a great job. You fucked me. But uh, it came up. I think we did again. Two takes, and we were out and got it. Linnea, I'm going to assume with what you went through on to turn living dead, you know, getting tackled by zombies in a graveyard, this might have been a walk in the park for you. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a lot easier. Um, the only part I dreaded was the final scene in the movie because I knew I would be in the makeup chair for a long time. We started at 3 in the afternoon one day, and I think we got the, the shot at dawn or something like that. So I think... We were in makeup for, I, I was, because I had Randy Cook, who I love, but he would like do the makeup and stand back and look, and do the makeup and stand back and look. It took like 14 hours, I'm not kidding. And I was just like ready to tear it all off. But, um, and then you get the jokes like, you remind me of an ex-girlfriend, or yeah. have you seen a dermatologist about that? And I'm like, okay, if I hear that again, I'm gonna just go nuts. So I Remember, think, I'm wearing fangs. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll bite you. I know. It was, it was just like everybody would say that, and you felt funny eating in front of anybody if you could eat, you know, through the prosthetics. It made acting possessed a lot more method out of it. It was easier like, for oh. you. I remember looking in the mirror and not recognizing myself, and it was a really scary feeling. Yeah, yeah. it's like, who is that? And people look at you different. Well, that was what I noticed is that, you know, Linnea was probably the only one that was within the, was kind of a star already in the horror community. So a lot of the crew guys knew who she was and they were kind of, ooh, Linnea Quigley. Ooh. And so she, they reacted to her a specific way on the set when she would show up, hubba, 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 whatever. And she showed up in the makeup and guys who had been lusting after her wouldn't even look at her. Like, it was funny. It's like, it's just makeup, but it was so good disturbing. that it was disturbing enough that you would be like, uh, yeah, come back when you've got that on. <laughs> it, it was really, uh, it was really striking. Oh, how funny! I didn't even know about that. <laughs> Out of curiosity, do any of you have any great experiences working with Steve Johnson? I mean, he was amazing in this. I always think of the, the boob gag. Oh, well, yeah, I can't help but great. think about that. You know, well, it's funny. I Steve and I did not get along. Because he, well, you know, if you see the commentary of uh, the uh, interviews, we talk about it. And we're actually, we're really good friends now. I mean, we hang out, we, you know, and I love him to pieces. But, you know, it was his, it was, my film, Witchboard, did not come out yet. So this was still a showcase for me. Uh, everybody who worked on it wanted to showcase their best of their abilities. And Steve did too. But Steve would actually, like, screw up my schedule. Like, he would just 
say I can do the makeup in five hours and seven hours later yeah. I'd still be waiting for it. So finally I just said, I can't do this, Steve. If you're not ready, I'm going to shoot it as is. And he got really mad at me, but I said, listen, you know, and I finally we, at one point I said to him, I know, Steve, I know, because this was the first film by his own shop. He had started his own shop. He left Richard Edlin, and he'd gotten a job uh, to do a Michael Jackson video, which he bought a shop. He got like a, you know, he was going to get a big advance, so he bought a shop, he hired a big crew, and then Michael Jackson fired him. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, uh-oh. And we offered him the job like the next day, and he, which is probably the only reason we got him, because uh, we weren't paying a lot either, but he needed the job, so he took it. And, but, but then he knew that this is his first film out of the gate. He had to really come on like gangbusters. So he wanted his stuff showcased. But I finally had to sit him down and said, listen, I understand that, but I want my directing showcased. The actors want their performances showcased. The DP wants his lighting showcased. The camera operator wants his camera movement. We all want to be showcased, and it's my job to make sure that what ends up being showcased is the entire film, not just one spot. So um, I finally, what I did was I, we made a compromise. We took the two most elaborate effects, which was the eye gouge and the razors in the throat, and I agreed not to shoot them while we were shooting the film. We put them at the end, we added on one day, and we spent half a day on the razor effect and half a day on the eye effect, which is why they turn out so amazing. And that was, I, the, I said, if you can then get them in their makeup and out there at the wall on time, <laughs> and, uh, I will yes. kill you and you won't have to kill me. <laughs> and actually, when we did the wall scene, because it was like all eight of, the, eight of them were possessed, he called in favors. So we had like a dozen Oscar winners oh, yeah. working on there for free, just yeah. as a favor to see, because everyone had to have their own makeup. So in order to make our schedule, so. Well, I ended up marrying him, so you can imagine <laughs> like, going somewhere, how long it took him to get ready. <laughs> you, you two fell in love on this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Steve's yeah. a screenplay. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I have this huge know. crush on Steve Jobs. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. telling you my secrets now. And then I hear that he is plaster casting Linnea Quigley's chest. Nice. And enjoying the process a little bit too. <laughs> and oh, I no. went, oh, damn. Yeah. Okay, okay, there it goes. No, oh my God. And then I got you married it. I know it. But I got shit for it because he said, you just came in the shop and took off your top. And I'm like, well, that's what I was supposed to do. <laughs> he gave me shit about it. I know. We went to see the cast later, and he could not stop talking about this beautiful actress coming in. And, you know, she had the most perfect breasts. And I said, oh, uh, you, ca you did the cast. And, yeah. And, I, and, he go, and he was obviously enamored with her. And I said, well, maybe you should uh, take her to dinner or something. That's the least you can do after you rub gloop all over her. <laughs> On that note, I think we should open up the floor for questions. <laughs> All right, who's first right up here? Uh, I was just wondering what your favorite behind the scenes moments were. Um, Philip Tanzini had his arm chopped off and was spewing blood. And this was before there were laws that you can't go out in public in special effect makeup. <laughs> And one morning, after we'd been up all night shooting, and he's missing his, it's just a bloody stub. He drove through, was it Burger King? Yeah, probably. Oh, my God. <laughs> and drove and pulled yeah. up and had the girl, you know, reaching out to take his order, and, and, and here he is with the arm spewing blood. <laughs> and so, for me, we had practical jokes going. I think there are a lot of movies now that people are very serious. And... Also, Billy Gallo was running around with a stake sticking out of his heart, <laughs> and he would make it jump, you know, and he'd be, and it's so, it was a fun cast with a great sense of humor. Well, Billy was so buff that we couldn't, when he was laying there with the stake and he was supposed to be dead, he could hold his breath, but because he had like zero body fat, every time his heart beat, the stick would go. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of shape, would you? You know, my two behind the scenes, all both Phil. 
we were shooting with this stuff called cookie smoke, which is now banned because they decided it was carcinogenic. Yeah. But when you smoke up the house, you can't see the smoke on camera, but what it does is when someone turns on a flashlight, it gives this beautiful beam of light. So that's why we have all these beautiful beams come through the windows and everyone's flashlights. Looks amazing. But we had a mixture of white and blue smoke. And you'd go home at night and blow your nose, and it would just oh. Oh. lots of blue yeah. <laughs> coming out of your nose. So we had a prop department handles the cookie. And what it is, it's like a chunk that looks like styrofoam. They put it in an actual frying pan, and they light it, and it catches on fire. And then they put out the fire, and it wafts, and smoke comes off. And the guy walks through the room with a fan <laughs> and fills the room with smoke. And then you let the smoke settle, and then you shoot. So we're getting ready to do a shot, and the prop guy's assistant was very gung-ho and and he was always, that was his job, so he would make sure, do we have enough smoke, do we have enough? So we're getting ready to do Phil's close-up when he's at the fireplace, looking at Linnea's butt. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's on him, and we're just about to shoot, and the effect, uh, the uh, prop assistant goes, do you need more uh, smoke? And Phil goes, I'll check, and he shoves his finger up his nose, <laughs> and he pulls it out, and it's blue from here up, and he goes, no, we're good. <laughs> And the second one is he's in the coffin with uh, Jill Tereshita, and she, they, we did a take of them having sex in the coffin, then she gets out to go uh, touch up her body makeup. So Phil's laying in the coffin just wearing a G-string, and he and the first AD would banter all the time, so the first AD is leaning on the lid of the coffin, and he's, and he's, he's talking to Phil, he's telling him a story or whatever, and Phil's listening, and I'm just standing there dealing with, you know, the DP or whatever, but I'm hearing... And I don't even know what the story was. The lab he's talking. You know, and when he's done, Phil just goes, uh, hey, dude, do me a favor. Stop looking at me down there. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, guy, the first thing, he fell on the floor laughing. And I, oh, you know, God. It's like, those are my best memories of behind the scenes. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think if I, I remember anything. It was just all such a whirlwind. Um, I think just when we first like all met, I remember Phil being like a teenager, just like all that energy, yeah. and I remember the first AD would just correct him all the time, like, ah, you know. Yeah. Like you his know. daddy. Yeah, and I remember, the, I, it was horrible at the time, but when they're doing the scene where they all go around, they have the camera in the middle, and they're going around the room, and I'm supposed to say, woos, wuss, wuss. I didn't know if to say woos or wuss. <laughs> and so I would be, you know, because I'm supposed to be a teenager. And so they would be having the camera go around, and my mind's going, wuss, woos, wuss, woos. I'd be so nervous, and they're really crazy. But I got it. For the record, it's wuss. <laughs> I, know. I still don't know. Uh, yes, um, I know we talked about this last night, Kevin. But um, I, I know. Oh, no, I know. Like <laughs> you know, I'm so I'm I'm so intrigued by the lipstick scene. I, <laughs> you're laughing. It's so funny. Yeah. Hernandez got magic boobs, and yeah. she just do that. She showed that to me in the audition. I said, we have to put that. In the <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought all women had that. You know? I'm, just, I'm, I'm so intrigued about the special effects. You notice she's not carrying a purse. <laughs> It was a prosthetic. Uh, back then, all the the makeup they wore was foam rubber. They didn't have uh, uh, the silicone and latex that they have now, which looks better, looks more like skin, is easier to apply, easier to remove. It was all foam rubber that had to be stuck on with glue and then peeled off. Mm -hmm. yeah. But for the shot of the breast, foam rubber wasn't going to cut it because I wanted you know you had to be close on it when it went in, and so Steve said, I'm going to make it out of gelatin, because gelatin <coughs> has a translucence like real human skin. The problem is it's gelatin, so it looks great, but you make the mold, you have to stick it in a fridge like jello. And when you pull it out of the fridge, you've got maybe two hours before it starts to turn into jello-like liquid. <laughs> so he said, when I build it, we have to shoot it right away. So we rehearsed it yeah. without, the, it's, it's a plate that goes from here to here and then it's hidden by her neck her chin down and it's tucked into the waist of her skirt and you remember she's got her shirt open right, right. so you don't see the sides because the shirt blocks oh, that very real. Yeah. Yeah. 
And what I wanted was I didn't want to do one fake boob and have her really topless and then cut for the effect. Because I said, the audience will know that's what we did. Right. I said, we'll start out wide and I'll push in. And Steve was worried because when I built a hole, he goes, you won't see the effect. I said, but I'll do a push in. So by the time the effect happens, we'll be in our close up, but we didn't cut. We pushed in. So everyone thinks they're looking at her real boobs. And then they're completely creeped out. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't know they could do that. <laughs> Confused a lot of men. Yeah. But the problem was, she's right-handed, so we had it for the left boob, so she could do that. But when we rehearsed it, her hand doing it this way blocked the effect. So he said, oh, okay, you got to use this hand. So I said, uh, hello, I'm right-handed. <laughs> so she was really nervous that... You know, doing it with her left hand and having to do it. it was a very awkward and unnatural way to do it. But we did two takes. They both went perfect. Yeah. And we were done. Wow. Yeah, but we, we rehearsed before we even brought it out. Just yeah. The camera move and how long it would take her to get there and the camera to get there, too. Well, it just looked very real. I mean, yeah. It was amazing. I'd look in the mirror with it on. I'd be like, oh, my gosh, I'm topless. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it must be Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> I like watching Kevin reenact it personally. It's very funny to sit up here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he does it at home quite often. Well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, back there. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> the, the iconic dance scene, the music selected for that had so much to it. Who chose that track and did she yeah. did you dance with it when you filmed it or was it after it? Was it live? Well, do you remember the actual uh, song? Joe had it in his script. It was another, it was another Bauhaus, but it wasn't that it one. It wasn't the right one. No, that was oh. the right song for yeah. that. Yeah. She picked I it, insisted brought it in. that we use that song. And I, um, I couldn't believe when we actually got the rights to that song. Yeah. But what a difference that yeah. made to have Stigmata Martyr as that song. And, and mm -hmm. so you danced to something else. No, no, she danced to oh, Stigmata. Yeah. She brought it in to dance to so it, I and we all it. said, oh. Yeah, Once we heard her, saw her dance to it, it was like, this has got to be the yeah. song. So then we started, you know, looking for rights. Doing, yeah, going through the arduous task of finding the rights and, and bargaining and, and, and you negotiating. Really the music, didn't you? Yeah, well, you picked it to dance to. We weren't necessarily going to use it because we didn't even know if we, we didn't have the rights to it. Yeah, we didn't think we had the rights to it. So, uh, but we, we thought this dance is so perfect with this song. And we went, it's funny, when I, I was one of the producers on the remake which had a much bigger budget. And they had a lot of great songs from Concrete Blonde and Goat Whore and uh, you know, every punk rat uh, band you can think of. And uh, at one point, the director of that, Adam, asked me, he goes, you had all these, you know, everyone was wearing these logos for all these great punk bands, but you didn't use any of the music. I said, well, we didn't have $4 million, buddy. We were lucky we got the Battle song. You know, we, we uh, didn't think we were going to, we actually weren't, planning to budget any songs. Dennis, was just, my brother who composed did the score, was just going to write all the songs because we really didn't think we would get anybody's song. So we were very pleased when we got the Bauhaus song. Yes. On the same thing on the dance, um, you know, the dress seems to transform during the process of the dance. Is that like two separate outfits or layers added, subtracted, or what? You're seeing stuff, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was. She had the wedding gown, and then, but it would have been real. Once she got dancing and was jumping, and you know, no way you would have done it in a wedding gown. Now, there were several different renditions of that dress. You know, one of them was when it, half the dress is burned off. And that was a body double who did a double flip off a three-story building. That's real. Yeah. That was real. She yeah. really did that. The girl jumped in did the middle of the night. Did it attach to a guy? Because it's a both of them. She did it, and half her body is really on fire. And she landed in a trampoline. No, no. What no. she landed? Boxes. They oh, couldn't no. get, they couldn't oh, get, oh my God. they usually use a big airbag, but because the, the area was too small to get an airbag in, they put cardboard boxes about three or four deep and, you know, fill, and I said, are you kidding me? He goes, no, if the boxes collapse, they, they break the fall. I said, really? And just before they did the jump, he picked up a piece of the picket fence that was laying there and he threw that on top. I said, what are you doing? He goes, that'll help break the ball, too. Oh. And it's two people. He's, the guy, she's wrapped around the guy, and he does a backflip off, and, and she's hanging on to him, and the two of them. 
That's amazing. It's amazing. It's never been photographed. There was a stunt that had never been done anywhere before. Yeah. And they're not dead. And, yeah. and, no, and they both got we don't know if they both, yeah, uh, <laughs> we, we didn't inform the crew because it would have been a downer. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there were services later. That's in, in two, right? No, one. No, one. When, when one. Sal gets, uh, Sal goes off the roof with uh, oh, Angela. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. The girl, half her body's on fire. That's right. Really? Really on fire? No, she was just smoking. <laughs> I was <laughs> uh, <laughs> She wasn't, like, actually on fire. Because Angela's out by then. She just... No, actually... No, Kevin, she's on fire. Watch <laughs> that, Kevin. She's not on fire. <laughs> You're all going to have to watch it again. To, yes. to, you know, help me Amelia's having an Alzheimer's well. <laughs> Kevin Tenney's a reckless director. I have Irish Alzheimer. I don't even remember the like <laughs> So to answer your question, yeah, that was a see-through dress. That was a different dress. It was actually layers of chiffon. There were five or six bright. different d dresses according to levels of possession. Yeah. So when she was doing her dance, we'd have... Because what we wanted was when she, we shot her from the side that, where she's between the fireplace, we wanted to create the illusion that the fireplace was making the dress transparent. So when we shot this way and she was dancing here and the fireplace was here, we put her in the chiffon so you could see through it. And then when she was dancing all around, we had her in chiffon so she could actually throw her legs around. And then when she stops dancing and Stooge comes up, she's back in the gown. It's just one of the fights I always enjoyed when it transformed. Wow, that's amazing you realize that. Yeah. Well, why not? When it transforms, you get to see Amelia's like amazing dancer legs. Yeah. <laughs> like, Hello, yeah. cheap effect, but looks great. Oh, Let's yeah. do that. Yeah. 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 We've got time for a couple more questions. Anybody in the back? I don't want to miss anybody. Okay, no, this gentleman. I um, I was really intrigued with the uh, the demon, the person who did the demon voice. Now, how did you incorporate that? Like when Angela would, you know, like be speaking. But obviously, it wasn't your voice. Like, how did you? Did you have that guy record that beforehand, or was, did you have lips to just sort of like pretend you're singing? He speaks, and how did that? Oh, that would be brutally hard to do it that way. No, they said their lines, and then in ADR, the guy came in and just dubbed them. We did. And he could actually just do that voice. Uh, I went to high school with him, and after we saw The Exorcist, he would cold call people. And go, Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and he would be awake all night. <laughs> and he thought that was pretty fucking funny. So uh, I know a guy who can do those voices, but uh, but actually, they couldn't speak very well with those teeth in. They would go, "I'm going to break your neck now." So I mean. They sounded horrible anyway because they had this mouthful of these teeth. So we just recorded them as a basically as a track oh, so God. he could dub to it. But hmm. we were silly teeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does it feel after all these years knowing that the film has such a strong following? I mean, uh, Kevin, you know, I'm a huge VHS collector, and uh, a lot of people out there still even collect the tapes. And there are a few people that. We'll go all the way to have every single copy of Night of the Demons on VHS even. So how does it feel knowing that it's actually become such a huge... I'm event? kind of sad to realize that mental illness has reached that <laughs> It's like, it's obviously an epidemic. You know, we had the screening in Hollywood, which, by the way, was packed. They put seats in the aisles and let people stand up in the back four people uh, four rows deep and they still turn people away at the door and about halfway through the film Billy Gallo who plays Sal was sitting in front of me and he leans back to me and he goes did you ever imagine when we were on the set shooting this that we'd be sitting here 25 years later with a packed house and I said no you, if you got in a time machine and you went back and questioned any of us or any of the other cast or crew and said do you know this is going to be a cult favorite? Yeah. <laughs> we said no. We didn't even expect the thing was going to be in theaters two no. weeks after it was released. No. It, it just it completely caught all of us off guard. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we got the first review we got was Variety, which is brutal because that's the trade paper for Hollywood, and it was a rave. I mean, like a frickin' rave. <laughs> and I called the producer and I said, "How much did you pay this guy?" <laughs> I couldn't believe we got that review. I thought. I mean, I thought the horror fans might like it, but I thought the critics were just going to butcher us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and some of them did <laughs> quite well. I still have uh, scars from some of those skewers. But, uh, but they were, I mean, 
the, even the ones who hated it were still impressed with the production value of it, you know, so. But, no, I don't think any of us, I, I, my, I get so many fans now that go, why didn't you make a soundtrack CD? <laughs> Never occurred to us that anyone would want one. I mean, yeah. you know, who wants a soundtrack CD to a film they never heard of? Mm -hmm. I, I think in retrospect now that I got to see it recently, and I hadn't seen it for like 20 years, uh, we're going for it. Now, we were getting less than minimum wage. It was a 23-day shoot. We're getting tortured. And as I'm watching, I mean, we're talking about what a perfectionist Steve Johnson was and what a pain in the ass that was. But that's also one of the reasons this movie was so good. Kevin was going for it. Nobody said, we're tired. We're not getting paid enough. We don't really care. And when I watch those performances, <coughs> Kathy Podwell, man, she was so authentic. I mean, there are scenes where she's screaming because a, a, a dismembered arm has attached itself to her oh, ankle yeah. and she's going to go, ah, 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 ah. I mean, that's not easy to do. I mean, everything that was done in that movie, and Linnea, you were terrifying, gorgeous, funny, wonderful, and terrifying. It would have been so easy for it to look silly or cheap mm -hmm. and have it be something that's just a big joke. The re I mean, what really makes the film scary is Kevin's choices and his camera work. Oh, yeah. yeah. The music also, he wasn't yeah. getting paid very much. He was yeah. going for it. Dennis but kicked ass. All of the yeah. actors, man, we put everything, you can tell, we put our soul into that movie. And we were young, we were hungry, we weren't well known. We just thought, hey, let's just give it all we got. So it's really kind of a, a pursuit of excellence that I think yeah. made the movie work. Yeah. And there's something in it that you all look at this and you go, hey, I, why, why does it appeal to you the way it does? Because we love it. Aww. Yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's probably the best way to end this. So thank you so much for coming out. Uh, thank you for coming to the convention. Absolutely. Thank you for, thank you for having us. Oh, thank you.